Hello everyone and welcome to Heartcore. This is Miko and we have Celestina on the other side of the world. What's up guys? Today we're going to be talking about Marilyn Monroe. She is one of those individuals that have captivated people for centuries and she's probably going to captivate people for much, much longer than she already has. She is a Hollywood icon who has acted in mainly roles that are a bit playing the naive blonde, if you haven't heard of her yet, which would be very surprising, but sometimes that happens. So yeah, I'm going to let Celestina tell us all about from birth to wherever we're going to end up probably to her death. But today we're going to focus on her life as an individual. And we're going to make this a two-parter because we went way down the rabbit hole into her lovers, which were far more than we expected. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited for you to tell us all about her. <laughs> as am I. So let's be clear, 48 hours ago, I knew literally nothing. I knew just a very small piece of Marilyn Monroe, like, happy birthday, Mr. President, in like 1962 when she sang for JFK's birthday, and that she was blonde and sang Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, and yeah, that's literally like all I knew going into this. So as per usual, I found a podcast. And major shout out to A360 Media, The Killing of Marilyn Monroe. It's an 11-part series. It is so good. It mixes her life with a little bit of true crime essence and like conspiracy theories or tinfoil tales, whatever we're allowed to say here. Dude, it was highly recommend. So we are going to start with Norma Jean Baker, born on June 1st. 1926. Wow. So she was born in LA to her mother who had some mental illness issues and that was pretty systemic in her family. So like there were several people in her mom's side with mental issues and she was born illegitimately. So her father was not really sure how they met, but he was not in the picture. He had his own family and wanted nothing to do with Norma Jean. So unfortunately, because her mom was not super with it all of the time, she was in, um, in and out of facilities, like hospital facilities, so that she could get the help that she needed. Norma Jean ended up going into foster care at a pretty early age. And back in that time, because it was like depression-y, pre-depression-y era, Roaring Twenties era, people who took in foster kids were actually like given a stipend like to their family for the kids. So it was, it behooved people to take in fosters and that didn't mean that they were going to a caring home. So she was unfortunately sexually abused in many of the homes that she was in as a small child. So she didn't have a father figure, didn't really grow up with kind male figures in her life and we're going to see that as being a theme later on in her life as well she was in and out of foster care until she was 16 the few times she was with her mom her mom painted this picture of her dad being this like knight in shining armor awesome guy and again he was never really in her life but that was like what she wanted in her world right she wanted the knight in shining armor she wanted the best guy out there for herself so when she was in 16, she actually ended up in a foster home with an older woman. And this was probably the best situation that she had been in her entire life. Like stability, older woman. However, had this older woman passed, she would have been slung right back into the foster care system. So the older woman suggested to her neighbor across the street, hey, Marilyn's 16, your son's like 21. How about she marries James Daughtry? And... Lo and behold, a couple of months later, when she turned 17, they got married, mostly in part so she could get out of the foster care system, which I think was a really solid move on her part. So this was the middle of World War II. James Daughtry was in the armed forces. I believe he was in the Merchant Marines, if I recall correctly. And 
she ended up, rather, Norma Jean ended up getting a job as, like, legit Rosie the Riveter status. So, like, whatever you picture, like, World War II ladies doing out there, like, she was physically making parts for the war actively, which is so dope. She then got found by a photographer while she was in that factory job and became a pinup model, like, during the 40s, right? So, like, the quintessential, like, curly hair done, like, skimpy clothing, put you on a wall during the war pinup model vibes. At this point, she was a brunette. And within this very short span of time, maybe like a year or two after she had gotten married to James, she got this pinup job, started making more progress towards being an actress. And this was one of her childhood dreams. So I forgot to mention that when she was in foster care, oftentimes the families would just like drop her off at the cinema in like downtown LA on like a Saturday or Sunday. And she would just sit in there all day dreaming of being the person on that screen, memorizing all of the lines and really kind of using that as escape as an escape for her. So This was her childhood dream now slowly coming to life. So this is like mid 40s at this point. Within this time period, she gets really good movie deals. She goes from brunette to blonde, has that quintessential Marilyn Monroe haircut, hair look. And at this point, she's really only in her early 20s, mid 20s, if you will, when all of this is happening. She gains stardom, again, stars in a bunch of movies. Then she married Joe DiMaggio in 1961. We are going to talk more about the relationships that she's had and all of these kind of interpersonal relationships. But I think truly, from everything that I've listened to, he is the husband who loved her the most, which I think is absolutely beautiful. That's just something to note there. Apparently, after she died... So sorry to cut you one second, but <laughs> your point to that you made that she's he seems to truly be the one that has loved her the most. He has sent her flowers to her grave after she passed every week for 20 years. Crazy. Boom. Just there you to go. Drop the romance in there real quick. <laughs> <laughs> This was, I mean, this was a really solid relationship for them, right? So at this point, she was a rising starlet. And I think it's important to note here that this probably still does exist in Hollywood, as we're seeing with the current cases coming out of Hollywood and what people are getting into just to get movies or whether that be in like the recording zone. She spent a lot of time on the like consulting couch, if you know what I'm saying. Essentially, she got passed around a lot of the executive producers so that she could be in movies. And this, I think, came from, I mean, her lack of having a solid father figure, being sexually abused as a kid, and then seeing people recognize her for how beautiful she is, right? And like that being her selling point, which I think is really unfortunate. I'm interested to see where this comes up, if this comes up in her design, or if this was mostly conditioning. But that was a majority of her like early to mid 20s was the rise of this late 1940s, early 1950s sex symbol and kind of just being passed around to do so. Essentially, when she married Joe DiMaggio, that was kind of like the, okay, cool, I've made this. I don't necessarily have to be this person anymore. After that, Joe was kind of on this downslope because he had left the Yankees. He was he was retired at that point. She was on this upslope and they they broke up amicably, but she was in this space in her life where she was just getting too big, too big of a star, and she felt like he was holding her back a little bit. She was also a lot more into drinking, drugs, doing all the things at this point. So what I noted though was that She got married to Joe DiMaggio before her Saturn return and then left him just after her Saturn return, which I thought was very interesting. So perhaps we can explore that a little bit more in the next episode as well. She waited one year and then got married to producer Arthur Miller. This was her longest marriage. It was five years. And again, during this time, still doing the, doing all of the most with her acting career. After she divorced him, In 1961, there was, what, two to three, three three-ish more years, four-ish more years of her life. So during this period of time, again, sex, drugs, alcoholism, and having relations with 
JFK with JFK's brother, Robert Kennedy, with her psychiatrist, with another doctor. So again, kind of using, falling back on the sex, drugs, alcohol piece of it to cope and to get through the things. There were often times in her last couple of movies, just showing up on set was really challenging for her and showing up well in a state to be able to act was very challenging. I don't recall the name of the movie. However, there was one where they basically had to fire her from it. They're like, no, you've cost us X amount of dollars. We can't have you continue to be here and not show up and have the whole crew and whatnot come out here. And then you just don't show up to set. And she did this multiple days in a row or would show up and would be out of sorts and wouldn't be able to perform. Eventually, they did end up calling her back after a short stint, renegotiating her contract, and then they finished the movie. However, she was in and out of rehab several times to the point of being incapacitated in rehab, right? Like, drug her more, drug her more, and that was kind of the solution, unfortunately. Thankfully, again, knight in shining armor, get it, Joe DiMaggio, was able to get her out of rehab during that period of time and get her off of the drugs. <laughs> for a, a little bit at least, and not be in that drug-induced psychosis that was happening in the mental institution that she had been checked into. Can we just for a second? She was only 36 <laughs> when she passed. And all of this is happening in that very short lifespan, which I think is absolutely insane. I think the culmination, or like kind of the crescendo before the culmination of all of this is in 1962-ish, she sang happy birthday to JFK. This was kind of the moment where she was like, yo, we're doing it. Hey guys, just see so that you know, we're not trying, or I'm not trying to put this on the down low. Like this is, this has been happening, just an FYI. Jackie Kennedy, fun fact, did not come to that performance that night. Understandably so, boo-boo kitten. And basically after that, JFK is like, you know what? we can't be so public about this. Like, why are you being cray? So he passed her off to Bobby Kennedy, his brother. And she actually really loved him. Like she actually like fell in love with Bobby Kennedy. My understanding is that during some pillow talk, both Kennedys shared some secrets that they shouldn't have, like national secrets that they shouldn't have with her. Maybe commie related, maybe Cuba embargo related, not so great. And she actually happened to be a communist sympathizer, seemingly, because of one of the former relationships that she had, as well as there were some ties to the Rat Pack. So Frank Sinatra, all of those guys who then, I guess, also had some relations to the mob. It just gets really fun and really deep in all of this. Anyway, we're at like 1962, 1963, She's in it pretty deep with her presidential relations, if you will, as well as Robert Kennedy's attorney general relations, if you will. She was very in, maybe a little bit too deep in to the knowledge around what they had at that point. I'm going to get a little bit tinfoily tail with you guys at this point. Most people will say, or as is reported, Marilyn passed of an overdose in L.A., with a phone in her hand after she had had a conversation with her therapist and a couple of other friends. However, the coroner's report was, I believe, deemed inconclusive. The stomach lining wasn't the right color for the pills that were ingested. Again, if you go into this podcast, this 11 series podcast, they go way more in depth about this, but there were just things that weren't adding up. There were also phone calls that were made between people of higher status that happened after her death. There were just like really random side comments from people who had seen her that day. Her housekeeper years later on a talk show had said, I'm too old for this. Why do I have to keep covering this up? Right? So there's just like a lot of like really sly side comments that have come up over the years that may indicate that this was a murder slash murder for hire slash covering up because pillow talk had gone too far. So all of that to say is this is very complicated. Marilyn Monroe is definitely more than a pretty face 
and I think was a lot more intelligent and a lot more knowledgeable about certain things that she shouldn't have maybe been privy to, but because of who she was, where she was, who she was surrounding herself with, became a lot more privy to some very need-to-know information and seemingly got out of hand. This is not a true crime podcast, but because we both love true crime, I thought I'd add that in. So I just thought that was really interesting. So yeah, now that you guys have a very brief history of Marilyn Monroe, her life, and her very early end, let's dive into her design and see what was, from our POV, like on the outside, what was truly the essence of her design versus how she may have been conditioned by the outside world. Thank you so much for this detailed information. Well, 20, you put a lot into 20 minutes, let's say it that way. <laughs> uh, the, the podcast probably goes into a lot more detail, of course, if it's an 11 episode podcast. I will still listen to it. I haven't listened to it, but I am very intrigued by, well, cases that are so spoken about, like Lady Di, JFK, Marilyn Monroe. So good. Chef's Kiss. Also, there was one note from like the, one of the like hardcore researchers of Marilyn Monroe. She went to UCLA's campus and they had files about like her her death, murder, quote unquote, if you will. And she was only able to retrieve four boxes out of like the 20 that they have there. The rest of them are locked until 2039. 77 years after her death. So guys, stay tuned till 2039 and we will have more information. Oh my God, that just makes it even more intriguing. <laughs> Do you know the Tesla files? That's another another similar thing where they have locked these files. Well, the FBI apparently completely seized them. There's another case. Is it JFK? I'm not sure. But there are quite a few cases where they have locked files up to a certain Point. And I find that extremely fascinating when, ha when that happens. So one point that I found also very interesting that you didn't come across this in the podcast was for me that she apparently had quite a few female lovers. And the things that I had found, they were mentioning that she even had difficulties connecting with men. The first husband that she had, she apparently, so this is all not proven, but this is what I've found and what I've heard. But the first wedding or marriage she had when she was 16, she confessed to her friend, allegedly, that she didn't want to sleep with him. I don't know if they eventually did or not, but at the beginning she said that she didn't really want to sleep with him. And to me, it makes a lot of sense if she has gone through abuse and I also often see that women who have gone through abuse by men that they have a tendency to feel more comfortable with women and she also seems to have had that so she had a drama coach called Natasha Lit Litus or Litus I'm not sure how to pronounce her name properly but she had apparently a very long relationship with her. So they even moved in together, they lived together. So Natasha was relatively jealous of the relationships that Marilyn Monroe had with men. There are other actresses and other co-stars, for example, that have talked about the relationships that they had with Marilyn Monroe. But it seems to be something where she did feel safer in some instances with women. Marlene Dietrich was another one that is mentioned who potentially could have had a relationship with her. So there are quite a few that came up. This was the first time I had ever heard of this. I never really researched about Marilyn Monroe either, but you hear things and what I heard was never that. So for me, it was an interesting side jump. Regarding her design, let's take a little look at what we can see here. The first thing we see is that she is an emotional projector. She is a 6'2 emotional projector. 
to be more specific. And she is a wide split. So what that means, she has the head defined, the ajna defined through the 63-4 channel. She has the emotional solar plexus and the root defined through the 19-49 channel. And she has a wide split in between the emotional solar plexus and her ajna. So that would make her a single definition. However, she's a, a split definition and she would need for example, gate 12 or 35 to connect her to the throat. And then she would need either gate 17 or gate 23 to connect her ajna to the throat to make her feel quote unquote complete. This is a little trick that nature is playing on us sometimes when we are a split definition. We tend to feel like something is missing. Nothing is missing anyone that is a split definition. It's just some innate feeling that we have. The interesting thing about a split definition is that it can be a narrow split, so that just one gate is missing to bridge your split, or it can be a wide split. And a tendency with a narrow split, so if only one gate is missing, is that we put the blame on us when something in relationships isn't working. But when there is a wide split, the tendency is to put the blame on the other people around you. So I don't know if this was a case with Marilyn Monroe, that she was more about saying, okay, you need to change X, Y, Z so that our relationship can work, for example. This is just a tendency that when there is a wide split, the blame is often shifted onto people around you and less accountability is sometimes taken. It's not even just accountability, but it's just, yeah, this, because even a narrow split cannot be accountable. <laughs> they can just completely blame themselves all the time to a point where it's self-harming and not even taking it accountability. So not necessarily the right way to put it, but let's keep going into her design. So what I've noticed with actors, a lot of times they have an undefined G center. And for me, this is a sign that they can really take in their environment. And she also had an undefined throat. She had an undefined spleen, sacral and ego. But the undefined G-center and undefined throat for me in combination as an actress is actually fantastic because you can take in your environment. You can become the scene or the movie that you're playing. You can become the character that you're supposed to represent. And you kind of go by how the other person in front of you is acting towards you. So I have actually never seen a movie of hers, but I can imagine that when she was on set, I would love to know how the behind the scenes looked for Marilyn Monroe and her co-stars when she was sober, because what happens in such a combination is really you're standing, she, she knows all the lines, but there is such an impact of how the producer has made her feel, how the director is making her feel, how her co-stars are making her feel. And then she plays along with this energy into her role. So I, I think she must have been a good actress. I don't, I actually don't know. I don't either. I don't think I've seen her movies, but... People did say that she was actually very witty, very funny as mm. well. Yeah, like a behind the scenes kind of situation, not necessarily like on set when recording, but mm. amongst her peers. Yeah, what I had heard is that, as you also kind of mentioned, that she became this, yeah, this naive blonde. And at some point she didn't want to play these roles anymore because this was not actually her. There was so much more to Marilyn Monroe, as you said, than a, just a pretty face. And she was over it. She didn't want to continue playing this naive blonde character anymore. What I do see in her design is her gate 22 in her conscious Mars. So for me to have this gate 22 in line four, you can see here that the limitation of social openness through the need for formality, she kind of changed her behavior to modify the interactions that she had and to potentially make them feel enriching. So this is kind of putting another point towards this undefined G-center and throat where she kind of becomes someone 
in a different situation, which is a typical thing for a G center. But this is again reinforced through her Mars. And the Mars energy is something that is very naive in nature. So it's something that it's a bit like the fool. I always mention this from the tarot where it starts like just very naive, nearly falling over the cliff, but somehow being lucky just to keep going, experiencing the whole journey within the tarot. And with Marilyn Monroe in this, the gate of grace in her Mars, this is something that she was playing around with. She was trying to figure out how to identify herself, even though an undefined G-center shouldn't necessarily be doing that. It's just go with the flow, keep being the chameleon, just change with every situation you're in, with the people that you surround yourself with, but be mindful to choose the right environment and to choose the right people because if you don't you end up potentially in this case doing way too many drugs drinking way too much alcohol and really falling into the wrong hands and wrong habits i think it's really interesting that her throat is undefined and she was a singer i just find that that's very interesting that that's not that it's still possible but like that she made it to like a very high level of like recognition and she had an undefined throat i just find that interesting i also also see that a lot with singers really actually yeah interesting like for example michael jackson he didn't have a defined throat either depending on which chart you look at but the one that He's either a reflector or a projector. So those are the two choices. So in either either design, he doesn't have the throat to find. She is the left angle cross of identification, which the name for the name itself for me is so ironic. It doesn't the cross itself doesn't really speak about what I'm about to say, but when I when I read this name, I'm like wow, okay, they're trying to identify themselves or identify things in a certain way. And with an undefined G-center, this to me is very ironic. But because, as I said, it's not necessarily what you're here to do. You don't need to put a fixed label onto yourself. Be fluid. And I feel like this is what she was doing with her sexuality, with her career, with with everything in her life she seems to have been fluid and the cross left angle cross of identification is actually a very logical cross so when you're seeing the gates it's so 16 9 63 64 three of those are logical circuitries in the collective circuitry it's not what i would have expected to have a lot of individual energy at least not the channels there are gates in there that are individual all over the place. But the channels are collective in nature. And the left angle cross is always someone who's here to, yes, you need to work on yourself and become the best version of yourself. However, you're really here to influence other people. As a projector, she really was here to somehow guide other people or inspire other people to become something and she was a big big inspiration to a lot i'm sure a lot of especially women and maybe even girls that were growing up and wanted to be her as a 6-2 projector i can only imagine what her life would have been like if she was allowed to live it longer until at least her coming back down the roof period so as a 6-2 she had a really trial and error phase in her 30s. I am so thankful that I was allowed to grow past that phase. And she was also, as Celestina pointed out, she was my age. She was 36, 37 when she died. And she was just entering her, or she was already on the roof, quote unquote, as a six line, but she had a very, very tumultuous up to 30s life and she would have been a very interesting role model in her later life as well i believe because we need this trial and error and yeah all this confusing time to then make sense of it later on i feel i feel like she was leaning into that though like even though there was drug 
and alcohol like issues in like 30 to 36 and probably before that too i recall hearing that she put a call into like a theater in la and she's like you're gonna play ella fitzgerald every night and i'm gonna come you're gonna play her and i'm gonna be in the audience every night and that's literally what fueled ella fitzgerald's the amazing jazz singer's career so i think she had that influence already and again if she had had her full life well she had a full life but if she had had her she had had a longer life to be able to like really make that impact i think it would have been epic yeah i mean imagine she was rooting for a black jazz singer ella fitzgerald if you don't know her listen to her please i beg you listen to her (laughs) i love her so she was standing up for a black singer which was not a thing back in the day not a very big thing at least she had ties to yeah some suspicious weird things like for example as you said the rat pack and frank sinatra even offered he gave her a little poodle that she called math like mafia (laughs) So I think, yeah, she she must have been witty. She must have had humor. Uh, I just wish that drugs are, ju- drugs are a challenge a lot of times. And I just wish that she didn't have to go through it because it's very difficult to get out of it, especially when you're in such circles and you have endless supply in these circles. And then she was also with very, very influential individuals like, yeah, JFK, his brother, And as I said, her sexuality, to me, this is a big thing for her to have had ties with women as well, especially at that time in this era. So I really think for someone, once she would have really grown into her strength and power, wow, this would have been, she was already a, a very fascinating woman and individual, but she would have been so unstoppable. I feel. I wonder, like, looking at the head Ajna connection in particular, I wonder how much she had to downplay her intelligence for roles and downplay her intelligence once she got into Hollywood because, like, that was what was expected versus being able to lean into these are my thoughts, this is how I process my thoughts, Perhaps because of the lack of connection between the Ajna and the throat, maybe it wasn't as easily expressed and easily portrayed. But if you, like, in see, the the podcast that I was listening to about all of this, they had clips of, like, her speaking in different points. I think she's quite poignant in the way she speaks. However, I think during the time period when people spoke like this, it just makes the woman feel so fragile and frail and unintelligent so you really can't tell you know i feel like we should do a whole episode where you speak like that (laughs) we might have to it's very soothing you know (laughs) (laughs) pillow talk with her must have been fantastic (laughs) (laughs) just imagine you're like i think you would Especially a man having sex with her, and then afterwards she talks to you like that, you're out in milliseconds. <laughs> Be like, Jack, are you in Khrushchev besties? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, no, but you're right. She didn't have a connection from her thoughts, her mind to the throat, neither did she have it for the emotional center, so. For her to express her emotions must have also been very challenging, her really true and deep emotions. This may be also a reason why a lot of her affairs were not official. They, I mean, apart from the fact that they were affairs uh, often with married individuals. That's, that's a good point why you would keep something secret. But I think she was also just, it was difficult for her to share her emotions. It is unconsciously defined from, well, the 19th gate is unconsciously defined. So already her grasping that she is an emotional being would have been difficult, especially because of the trauma that she experienced. So bottling up a lot of these emotions could have been the case for her. 
I sadly never met her, but uh, I feel like this may have been a thing. And her undefined ego is also pushing her with the 25th gate pointing to her 51st gate that is really pushing her to be the best, to be the greatest and to prove herself that she really can be all of the things. Did she have health issues? I think she had anxiety and depression, not to the same extent that her mom did. Although she had fear and anxiety that she would have mental issues to that extent. And she had doubts, yeah. Doubts, because this is the left angle cross of identification. It's not only a logical circuit, but it's also, it's basically about becoming so skillful and so good at something that you can create a life out of that skill. And people are really going to be inspired by this. So for her, yes, she has achieved that in the acting career, as it seems. I, as I said, I don't know if she was a very skillful actor, but her whole persona, creating that persona is a huge skill in my opinion. It's in an undefined throat. The 16th gate is in an undefined throat, so she doesn't have consistent energy flow towards it, but she has a lot of activation in her head. She's going to doubt a lot in her life if she's in her shadow of the cross, left angle cross of identification. Lots of doubts flowing in. Lots of wondering why and how things are happening even though she does have this ability to express part of it through the ajna if it's connected to her throat and she has two potential connections one is the genius to freak connection the 43rd gate which is defined in her ajna and she basically only need someone with a 23rd gate <laughs> or something with a 23rd gate to define it. It's always interesting to also look at what planets were transiting. Where were the planets transiting at what time? Because if Pluto, for example, or Neptune or Uranus or something like this, the longer transiting planets, if they would be defining the gate 23, gate 17, gate 12 or gate 35, the first two that I mentioned would give her the ability to speak more easily about her thoughts and ideas, even though it may sound like a freak sometimes when it's coming out, if it's not the right people that she's talking to. It can also be a very, again, very logically defined individual with the 60, 62nd gate. If the 17th gate would be then coming into definition for her, she would really be able to produce very logical concepts and create out of a huge mess of details that you would be seeing in front of you, she would be able to structure it and explain it in a very fluid and understandable way if gate 17 would be defined. On the other hand, gate 12 and 35, when they're being defined through others around them or through planets, it would give her the ability to share her emotions. So this is going to be very interesting who she connected with in this aspect from the few individuals we're going to choose as her main romance or life partners, even though it was just a short period of times. I definitely want to bring in one or two of the women to also see how that played out. And yeah, the major men in her life, JFK, Joe DiMaggio, people like that. Let's see. Well then, guys, hope you enjoyed this first little episode into the life that is Norma Jean slash Marilyn Monroe slash really excited for how her chart changes depending on the people that she's around. Stoked. Thank you everyone for listening. And we hope to see you next time. Ciao. Bye.